Hi everyone, this is Shakil Ahmed, your biology teacher, and today we will discuss an MCQ paper, paper uh, 1, uh, I mean variant 11 of the very latest year, uh, winter 2023. So let's go and start. The first question here is until recently, the typical viruses known to science were 20 to 150 nanometers in size. In 2003, the MIMI wires were discovered with the size of approximately 680 nanometers. In 2013, the Pando virus was discovered, which has a size of over 1000 nanometers. Which viruses can be seen using a light microscope with a maximum resolution of 0.25 micrometers and an electron microscope? So, first of all, uh, Going back to our concept about the resolution of the light as well as the electron microscopes, we know that electron microscope has a resolution of 0.5 nanometers. So that means all of these two filters for the light microscope, which means if we multiply 0.25 by 1000, this means 250 nanometers. So any virus which is greater than 250 nanometers will be seen under the light microscope as well. That means the typical virus will not be as its size is less than 250 uh, nanometers and the other two are greater than this one. So option B will be the correct answer for this. Now moving to question number two, the diagram shows an eyepiece graticule and a cell viewed through a microscope. When the eyepiece graticule was calibrated at this magnification, the whole length of the graticule shown covered 12 divisions of a stage micrometer scale. There were 100 divisions in 10 millimeter of the stage micrometer. So first of all, let's go to the calibration calculations. 100 divisions in the 10 millimeter stage micrometer means one division is 10 over 100, 0 0.1 millimeters. Now we say that 12 divisions of the stage micrometer are covering the whole of the eyepiece graticle scale, which means 100 divisions. So if 12 divisions is 0 0.1 uh, millimeter, means 12 divisions will be 1, 0 0.1 times 12, 1.2 millimeters. And high, 100 eyepiece graticules will be 1.2 mm, which means one eyepiece graticule is 1.2 over 100, 0.012 mm. So if we look at the length of this cell, we have 30 eyepiece graticules. So 30 eyepiece graticules times 0.012 will give us 0.36 mm the length of the cell and 0.36 times 1000 will give us 360 micrometers. So what's the actual length of the cell? We will have 360 micrometers. Now moving on to question number three. Tay-Sachs disease results in a buildup of lipids in cells. Which cell structure does not function correctly in this disease? If the lipids buildup takes place, that means the organelle, which is concerned with the breaking down of the lipids, has is malfunctioning. That means the lysosome. So lysosome is the organelle Golgi body. They prepare, they pack them uh, proteins. Mitochondria is concerned with the energy. So smooth endoplasmic reticulum, reticulum with the production of the lipids and other uh, steroids. So lysosome is the correct answer. Question number four, which animal cells would have the most extensive Golgi bodies? Golgi bodies are mainly very uh, abundantly present in those cells which have the secretion function. They have released some uh, proteins or any secretions. So here we can see goblet cells. They produce mucin. So we will have the extensive network of Golgi bodies in the goblet cells. Question number five, the diagram shows three circles, one, three, and five, and the shared structures, two and four. Which will correctly identify the three circles and some of the structures that are shared between them? So if we look at option A, circle one is chloroplast, circle two uh, is Then circle 3 is mitochondria, mitochondria also contains circular DNA. Then 4 is ATS ribosomes, but ATS ribosomes are not present in mitochondria. So this option is wrong. Now moving to option 2, if circle 1 is chloroplast, circle, then option 2 gives ATS ribosomes. ATS ribosomes are not present in the chloroplast. So this option is also then the no. option two is the now circular DNA. Now moving to option 3, okay, C, contains uh, circle DNA. 1 is prokaryotes and Two is circular DNA. Yes, prokaryotes do contain circular DNA. Three is mitochondria. Mitochondria as well contain circular DNA. And four is circular DNA. And fifth is chloroplast. And we can see the chloroplast also contains circular DNA. 
So option C is the correct answer. Now, we know about the genetic material in animal cells and prokaryotic cells is correct. We know the animal cells contain linear DNA. They do contain linear DNA because the prokaryote and animal cells are the eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have linear DNA. What is the prokaryotes contain the circular DNA of the loop of DNA? So that means, yeah, this option is correct. Prokaryotic genetic material is surrounded by a double membrane. No, that's not correct because we know the prokaryotes do not have the nucleus and the double membrane organelles. Uh, and prokaryotic genetic material is double stranded DNA. Yeah, DNA is double stranded even in the prokaryotes. So that means option C is the correct answer. Now, question number seven what's present in all viruses? Do all viruses contain uracil? No. Some viruses have the genetic material as DNA, that means uracil is not present. Do all viruses contain ribose? No, some viruses that do not have RNA do not contain ribose. Do all viruses contain thymine? Again, some viruses have the genetic material as RNA, so they do not contain thymine. Do all viruses contain gonin? Yeah, that's correct. Why? Because a virus will have a genetic material, whether it is DNA or RNA, both of them have gonin in it. Now, question number two. Eight, the test for non-reducing sugars requires a second Benedict test to be carried out. We know if there's a non-reducing sugar, we need to break it down by hydrolysis acid hydrolysis, and then we can use the Benedict test to check it for, for it. So question is, which set of steps is the correct method for carrying out the non-reducing sugar test before carrying out the second Benedict test? Let's look at the options. Perform the Benedict test which gives a negative result, that's correct. Warm gently with dilute hydrochloric acid. Why should we warm it gently? Perform the Benedict test with the color of solution remaining red. No, if the color of solution remains red, that means it contains the reducing sugar, not the reducing non reducing sugar. Perform the Benedict test with the color of the solution remaining blue. Boil with dilute hydrochloric that's the correct one because we can boil it so the reaction will go faster and then neutralize with sodium hydrogen carbonate. What was question number option D? Perform the Benedict test which gives a negative result. Neutralize with some no. We first heat it by, with uh, hydrochloric acid, then neutralize with the sodium hydrogen carbonate. Now, question number nine, the diagrams show three types of covalent bonds. So first one is the, we can see COO, the ester bond is there. Then we have the oxygen bridge or the glycosidic bond between present, present with the carbon atom. And we, we have the amide linkage or the peptide bond, C double bond O N H. Which bonds will be found in glycolipids? We know the glycolipids, they contain the ester because lipids are the esters. Uh, they contain the, uh, uh, what we call this, this oxygen bridge is present in the glycolipids as well, but they don't have the uh, peptide bond or the amide linkage. So this is present in the proteins only, or means the glycoproteins over here. So this is glycolipids only, glycolipids and proteins, glycoprotein, glycoprotein. So the option A is the correct one. Let's go to now moving on. number 10. Let's go. Which molecules would be found in an oil which is liquid more than, more than in a fat which is solid? We know the density of the lipids. Two, uh, and it the increases. Option two is the if we have DNA, okay, less okay, number of the hydrogen DNA, and then more number of the single covalent bonds. Means if there are saturated hydrocarbons present in the uh, fatty acid chains, it will be solid. If there are uh, unsaturated fatty acids, that means it will be in the liquid form. So, looking at number one, it has all of them are the saturated, so it will not be there. Number two, this is saturated, this is but this one contains a double bond, so this is unsaturated. This will be present more in the oils. Number three, again, all of them are saturated, so this will not be the present. Number four, we can see the unsaturated here, unsaturated here, so this will be present in the oils. So, two and fro. 4 means the D is the correct option. Now, moving on to question number 11, which row about the bonding found in the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of protein is correct? Primary structures, they do contain the covalent bonds because the peptide bond is a type of the covalent bond. Then secondary structures do not contain covalent bonds. So the second structure is the attraction between the uh, primary structure, which is mainly because of the hydrogen bonding. So the tertiary and the quaternary structure, they contain all types of bonds, hydrogen, ionic, covalent, as well as the hydrophobic interactions. That means option B is the only correct option in this case. Moving on to question number 12. 
The specific heat capacity of different substances is shown. Substance air has one joules per gram per degree Celsius specific capacity, hydrogen gas 14.3, water in the liquid form 4.2, and water in the steam form 2.1. So, which statement is correct? First of all, we must have the, uh, we must know what we mean by the specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance here by one degree Celsius. So, more the specific heat capacity means more heat is required to raise the temperature. Less the specific heat capacity means less heat is required to raise the temperature. So, which statement is correct? Air, air is more stable than water. This is completely wrong. Air only needs one joule of energy, whereas water needs uh, to 4.2 joules. So this option is not correct. It takes more energy to raise the temperature of hydrogen gas than it does to raise the temperature of water. So temp hydrogen gas needs 14.3 joules of energy to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, whereas water needs 4.2. This is correct. Yeah. A specific heat capacity of 4.2 joules per uh, gram per degree means that it takes 4.2 to vaporize. No, vaporize is not correct. That is the heat latent heat of vaporization. So this is also not correct. And there are more hydrogen bonds between water molecules in the gas than between water molecules in a liquid. That's completely wrong. In fact, in case of the liquid, we have them very closer together. So more can be in the liquid, not in the solid. So option B is the only right option for this. The solid line on the graph represents the product formed over, the, over time for a reaction in a cell. Which other line represents the effect of adding the enzyme for this reaction? So the solid line represents the reaction in the cell. When we are adding an enzyme, what does the enzyme do? It speeds up the rate of the reaction by decreasing the activation energy of the substrates. So that means the product amount means the final product, its yield will be same, only the reaction will go faster. So B cannot be because B is producing the more product, D is producing less product. That means A is C is uh, having the less, uh, it's produced the same amount, but it is going slower. So A is the one where the reaction goes faster and the yield of the product is the same as the normal reaction. Now question number 14, the graph shows how the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction is affected by the change in temperature. Standardized. So, what is the factor limiting in the at the region rate in the region X? So, we can clear the C here. On the x-axis, as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases. Means temperature is the limiting factor. So, option C will be the correct option for this. How will the removal of a reversible non-competitive enzyme inhibitor affect an enzyme-catalyzed reaction? First of all, it's not. Uh, competitive if it's, there's a competitive inhibitor that will affect the km that uh, increases the km of the uh, of the enzyme so non competitive enzyme inhibitor does not have any effect upon the km of the enzyme but in yes if we remove this it will affect the vmax because more the reaction will go faster that means the km will decrease this is wrong the km will increase this is wrong the km will not change and the vmax will increase this is the correct option now Question number 16. The dimensions of three of our cylinders, X, Y, and Z, are summarized in the table. Cylinders X, Y, and Z, they have the radius and they have the length. What is the correct order of surface area is to volume ratio for the cylinders from smallest to largest? So we have to calculate the surface area. These are the cylinders. So surface area of a cylinder is pi 2 pi r into r plus L. L is the length. Whereas the area uh, volume of a cylinder is pi r square into h or l. So we'll calculate the surface area, we'll calculate the volume of each one of them, then we'll see the ratio between them and we can answer this question accordingly. Now moving to question number 17. Three individual plant leaf cells were placed in different solutions for 30 minutes. Each solution had a different water potential. Which row correctly shows the change in the volume of the three cells after 30 minutes? So we have to see the change in the volume. If the water potential of the solution is lower than the cells, if the water potential of the solution is lower than the cells, means the cell will get dehydrated, it will lose water. So volume will decrease. Equal to the cells, there will be no net movement of uh, the solution, so it will remain same, no change. Higher than the cells, if the water potential is 
of the solution is higher than the cells. That means the water will move into the cells. That means their volume will increase. So we have decreased, no change and increase. That means B is the correct option. Question number 18 over here. Which row is a representation of one chromosome at the beginning of prophase of mitosis and the number of DNA strands in the chromosome? First of all, we know at the beginning of the prophase, the uh, S phase has already taken place. So each chromosome has the two chromatids. And each chromatid is made up of one DNA molecule. One DNA molecule has two DNA strands. So two chromatids and four DNA strands will be the correct answer. Number 19, which events are part of mitosis, interphase, telophase, and cytokinesis? We know interphase is not part of mitosis. It takes place before the mitosis. Telophase is a part of mitosis. And cytokinesis is the uh, division of the cytoplasm, which is also not a part of mitosis. So D, that two, is, only the, is the only option. Now moving to question number 20. The statements about genes and proteins involved in breast cancer. The protein coded by the BRAC1 gene inhibits the growth of breast cancer cells. Means it is there to inhibit. The, if the gene expresses, there are less chances that the breast cancer will take place. The protein coded by the P53 gene suppresses tumors. Again, the protein produced by this will suppress the tumor, so there are less chances of having the breast cancer. Which combination of genes is most likely to result in breast cancer? That means if both of these genes are not able to express themselves, they are not, they don't have the normal, they have the mutation, they are not able to have the normal activity. There are chances that the breast cancer will happen. That means option A is the right answer. Uh, we'll continue with the rest of the uh, questions from 21 to 40 in our next video. Thank you very much. Thanks for your uh, attention. Thanks for your concentration. Bye.